This is When Science Speaks, a new web series profiling innovative and interesting people working in science and technical fields, from academia to industry to the nonprofit world. We explore how to be a powerhouse advocate for science and your research, how to advance your career in meaningful ways that make you happy, and how to push back on the ongoing assault on science and other related issues of interest happening in the world. Well, hey, everybody. It is Mark Bayer, and you're tuned in to When Science Speaks. Thanks so much for being here. Today's episode is brought to you by Bayer Strategic Consulting in Washington, D.C., which helps scientists and engineers get funding, gain influence, and build relationships with the stakeholders who matter the most in their professional environment. If you'd like to be notified of upcoming episodes of the show and receive bonus material, just text Science Speaks to 44. 222. That science speaks to 44222. It is such a great privilege to have Dr. David Michaels on the show today. David is an epidemiologist and professor at the George Washington University School of Public Health. He was Assistant Secretary of Labor for Occupational Safety and Health from 2009 to 2017, which is the longest, which makes him the longest serving head of OSHA in its history. And he also was Assistant Secretary of Energy for Environment, Safety, and Health from 1998 to 2001, charged with protecting workers, residents, and the environment around U.S. nuclear weapons facilities. Under David's leadership, OSHA strengthened exposure standards for silica and beryllium, and and also issued new rules on safety, while greatly increasing the agency's focus on the healthcare industry. He also issued OSHA's first compliance guide and recommended practices for employers for preventing and addressing retaliation against whistleblowers who raise safety concerns. David's current work is on the relationship between safety and health management systems, operational excellence, and sustainability, which is a topic on which he lectures frequently, and also on improving the protection of workers exposed to COVID-19 as the economy reopens. David is a leader in efforts to protect the integrity of the science underpinning public health and environmental protections, and he's author of numerous articles in leading scientific publications, as well as Doubt is Their Product, which was published by Oxford University Press in 2008, and a new book, which is The Triumph of Doubt, Dark Money and the Science of Deception, which we're going to get into in just a moment. David's article co-authored with Gregory R. Wagner, MD, entitled Occupational Safety and Health Administration and Worker Safety During the COVID-19 Pandemic was just published by the Journal of the American Medical Society, otherwise known as JIMA. David received the American Association for the Advancement of Science's Scientific Freedom and Responsibility Award, the American Public Health Association's David P. Rail Award for Advocacy in Public Health, and the John P. McGovern Science and Society Award given by Sigma Chi, which is, of course, the Scientific Research Society. David earned his PhD in Sociomedical Sciences at Columbia University, his Master of Public Health in Epidemiology from Columbia's Mailman School of Public Health, and his BA from the City University of New York City College. Welcome to the show, David. Well, Mark, it's great to be on the show with you. You know, I'd like to start with a project that occupied a lot of your time lately, which is improving the federal response to COVID-19, and particularly your work with the National Academy of Sciences on the equitable distribution of the vaccine whenever it's deemed safe and effective. What can you share with listeners about this project and the outcomes that you and your colleagues were aiming for? Yeah, this has been a really exciting uh, initiative for me to be part of. You know, normally, Occupational safety and health doesn't make the front page of newspapers. In fact, it's often not in newspapers or, or the media at all, except when you have you know, a disaster or a group of miners are trapped underground and there's a dramatic rescue attempt and everybody in the country is watching. Um, but otherwise, workers are sickened, they're injured, and they're killed on the job one at a time, and it's, it's sort of forgotten about. That's changed with COVID-19. Articles about studies on focus on uh, worker exposures and their impact on workers, on patients, on the society are in newspapers, in the media, on TV every single day. Mm-hmm. And the, fo- the country's focused on it. And this uh, initiative that came out of the National Academy is really uh, reflective of that. We were asked, first, I'm part of an expert panel chosen by the National Academy of Sciences 
charged by the Centers for Disease Control and the National Institutes of Health to come up with a framework for the equitable allocation of the coronavirus vaccine. Who should get it? Who should get it first? Who should get it next? Because if and when the FDA says, here we have a vaccine that works, we're not going to have enough for everybody. At the beginning, we estimate there'll be enough for perhaps three to five percent of the population, and then a few months later, 10 or 20 percent. And so, you know, who should we tell to get in the front mm -hmm. of the line? Mm -hmm. And obviously, there are, are people who are at great risk of dying quickly because of age and comorbid conditions, and they're going to be at the front. But also, what we said was that we have to think about workers at every stage of this, and they, um, because our objective is to reduce death, serious uh, illness, but also to make sure society is able to function. And so at the very top of the list are going to be healthcare workers, but not just the ones you think about, the emergency room workers who are covered with, um, who wear uh, scuba suits and are, are very well protected, mm -hmm. but those nursing home workers who are at very high risk of disease mm -hmm. themselves. And because of the nature of nursing homes, they go from patient to patient and also, uh, unfortunately, and certainly unintentionally spread the disease. And home care workers often are older women themselves who are taking care of people who are significantly older at great risk for disease. We have to protect them. And then in the second phase, in addition to some people who are at some increased risk of, of, uh, of the illness because of their age and, and other illnesses, um, we have all these sort of previously invisible workers who are so important to society's functioning, you know, the farm workers. Mm -hmm. And you, they're not being studied enough. Purdue University is estimating right now about 125,000 farm workers have been infected with COVID-19. And if you look at their conditions, they're working right next to each other. And even if they're given the proper masks, um, they're often living in employer supplied housing where there you know six or sometimes 12 people or more in the same room sleeping mm -hmm. they're on buses and they, um and of course many of them are undocumented and are afraid to get medical care All right and so there's a lot of discussion in this about which workers we're going to protect and how they're going to be at the front of the line so it's been a really interesting and i think important initiative Oh, absolutely. And I, I want to touch upon something in that same, you know, universe, your focus has been on the equitable distribution, uh, as, as we talked about, and as you described, um, this is also going to be happening this by by this, I mean, the distribution process is going to be happening in this environment of incredible misinformation and deliberate disinformation and about the vaccine, for example, and you know, for the past few years, I've been particularly interested in how to combat these so-called alternative facts I've spoken and, and been published on this topic. It's just one that I'm really passionate about. And your most recent book, as I mentioned in the intro, is The Triumph of Doubt, you know, Dark Money and the Science of Deception, which I highly recommend listeners, by the way. Um, what do you mean when you, well, first, maybe you could comment a little bit on this environment in which, you know, you and your colleagues on the expert panel were working um, with respect to information, and also as far as it relates to your new book, what do you mean by the science of deception? Uh, what, what, what is intended by that phrase? Yeah, no, this is a challenging uh, topic for the country right now. I mean, to put this into some context, pre-COVID, you know, we've had essentially over the last many decades, the increasing use of what I call mercenary scientists, mm -hmm. scientists who've been hired to produce you know misinformation essentially mm -hmm. to manufacture uncertainty because you know we have the country really thinks of science as this very simple sort of uh, facts are learned we move forward we learn more and more and more it's much more complicated and there's always sort of back and forth and there's always uncertainty and when you're protecting the public either their the public's health or the environment You've got to make decisions based on uncertainty, and you have to figure out what's real uncertainty and what's the, the implications of not making a decision or making a decision. That challenge has been sort of manipulated by different industries. Mm -hmm. So the government doesn't react, doesn't essentially offer protections. You know, most notoriously, we think about the tobacco playbook, and everybody right. knows the tobacco playbook. You know, when tobacco uh, realized that 
uh, when people saw that tobacco causes lung cancer in the 1950s, they would have a lot of trouble selling cigarettes. So they spent a lot of time, a lot of money hiring scientists to say, well, we're just not sure. We're going to do the research, but you know, the, the, the evidence isn't in yet. And when more evidence came in, they had to sort of up their game and figure out exactly how to take that on. That model is very effective. Mm -hmm. And what I show in my book, The Triumph of Doubt, a lot of the same scientists who worked for tobacco then moved on to work for other chemicals who worked in climate change. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm not saying that they're lying, but certainly what they're doing is very overtly trying to stop public health protections. What that's led to, or it's certainly contributed to this mm -hmm. great um, suspicion of science. You know, there's a, this idea that scientists can't agree and there's always this disagreement and we just, so people throw their hands up in, in disgust. And that's, I think, a component of this vaccine hesitancy. I think there are mm -hmm. a lot of different components to it, but one that we see very clearly is, well, you know, scientists disagree. We, how, how should we make a decision if the scientists can't agree? Uh, that's why in some ways one of the most effective anti-vaccine um, uh, scientist was a fellow who faked all his data, this right. guy named Andrew Wakefield, Wakefield who published, right. published an article that was later retracted and his right. medical license was taken away from him. Yep. But he uh, published phony data to say that uh, vaccine expo vaccines were associated with autism. And they could convince lots of people, and even people who later heard that that study was fake, now they're just confused. They don't know what's real. And it sets us back. Of course, now with uh, this whole discussion about fake news and the, the, what the RAND Corporation has called truth decay, mm -hmm. there's huge lack of trust in all sorts of different institutions. And we need to have institutions that you can trust. I and mean, that's why the National Academy of Sciences was set up. It was chartered by Congress during the Civil War to say we need an authoritative body to say we're going to pull together the best scientists and, and advise the government, advise the people of the United States what to do. And of course, we're in a situation now where so much of the country doesn't trust anyone. They think everything is sort of partisan. It's being you know, bought and paid for. Mm -hmm. And I understand that because we've had so much of that. And we're going to have to overcome that because, of course, if a lot of people don't want to take this vaccine and assuming the vaccine works, that'll extend the course of this pandemic mm -hmm. far longer than you need to. Right, right. That's such a huge risk. Thanks for going into detail on that, David. You know, in the introduction for the triumph of doubt, there is included in your assessment of the so-called deflate gate scandal surrounding the New England Patriots and, and potential cheating during the 2015 season. Of course, I have to say as a native New Englander and a Pats fan, I'm not going to go into the merits of that here. Uh, but seriously, the, the introduction of the book also references the idea that historically science is supposed to be apolitical, you know, above politics is sometimes how we hear it described. Can you elaborate on that perspective that science is supposed to be, so to speak, above politics? And is that accurate? And has it really ever reflected reality if we understand politics to be about power within a society and the ability to shape community behavior? Well, that's right. See, I mean, people think of science as being sort of neutral, objective, but it's used by people in power and it impacts power. And power, of course, isn't only politicians, but power, you know, corporations, lots of groups have mm -hmm. power. I began with the deflate gates story, even though it's it's certainly less consequential than the other stories I talk about in sure. terms of, of sugar and diabetes right. or air pollution. But what's interesting about this story is that everybody who follows football and some who don't are grabbed by this, where you have uh, the National Football League that is convinced that Tom Brady cheated. And what they did was they did the same thing the tobacco industry did or that the diesel engine industry did, the, the fossil fuel company does, the alcohol industry does, which is they went to one of these firms which specialize in creating whatever sort of report you need. Mm -hmm. The business model of, in this case, Exponent is the firm, but I talk about a lot of them in the book. Mm -hmm. um, you, if you work for your company and you need something to exonerate your product or to say whatever it is, these firms will do that. That's their business model. They would go out of business if they don't do that. 
And those, that's the same thing the government now does. The Trump administration is using some of the same firms because they want something that looks like science. You know, the, there's a, um, you often hear someone say, you know, we, we need to base this decision on sound science. And of course, when I hear that, the hair on the back of my <laughs> neck goes up. Uh, what they're saying is not that they want to base this on sound science. They're saying they want something that sounds like science. <laughs> but isn't so it sounds like science but it's not that's right and uh you know that can be very confusing for consumers obviously who are are trying to make sense of what this all means um you know thinking about the current proliferation and consumption of misinformation and disinformation particularly around topics grounded in science such as global warming and we talked about vaccine safety and efficacy a moment ago do you think we're seeing something that's a difference in scale or a difference in kind? You know, meaning, have we seen this type of dynamic before, but now it's just supercharged by social media and related factors, for example? Or is the current environment something new and different and perhaps even more dangerous? Well, you know, it's been going on for a long time, and there, there's lots of evidence of that. Uh, different industries have done that for a long time. Uh, for the most part, though, the government has stayed away from that. It's influenced by these things, but um, right now, I think more than ever, the federal government is playing a role because they they want to shape this conversation and uh, really throw sand in people's eyes, you know, metaphorically, to to cause confusion and to to say we we can't agree if what, you know, the president, of course, is famous for uh, claiming something that he doesn't agree with is fake news. And so then you've got this debate, you know, what, what's real, what's not. Um, the president's advisor at the beginning of the uh, term talked about uh, alternative facts. Of course, every scientist I know who heard that's alternative facts. What are we talking about here? So while I think it's been around for a long time, the scale of this um, has increased, but also the partisan nature of the country, the way we're so polarized, has allowed people to um, sort of Uh, grab onto that. And frankly, people on both sides see the worst in the other side. And I certainly understand why that is. Uh, So you have people believing things that probably, as far as we can tell from a scientific point of view, are not true or not totally true. And it's going to be very hard to overcome that Mm. and to build up those sort of authoritative institutions that that give you uh, a reasonable explanation. This is what we think we know. Here's here are the uncertainties and here are the the range of uncertainties and and the the importance of making decisions in the face of those uncertainties. And right now it's very tough to do that. Right, right. I think that's such an important point that you made, David, about the range of uncertainties. You know, it's sort of like, well, if, you know, scientists are divided or scientists are not sure, I mean, there, of course, there are degrees, right? I mean, if, if you have one or two scientists or institutions versus the the preponderance of the evidence in the other direction, it's very different from, you know, really being split on a topic, but often it's presented just as uncertainty. And then, of course, you've got to decide what are the, uh, what's the gravity of the decision? You know, when you, I remember when I first read, this was, I think, January 2nd, about the outbreak in Wuhan, Mm -hmm. and having, you know, being an epidemiologist, having right. read a lot about the pandemic flu in, in 1918. And I looked at that and said, boy, you know, this, this could be really significant. We should do something. Um, you could look at, at various points in the, the trajectory of this disease and said, well, what are the implications of this? You know, during the um, Obama administration, I was very much involved in a response to Ebola, mm-hmm. but also to SARS and to MERS, which mm-hmm. is a, a corona disease uh, that's a coronavirus that's associated with uh, exposure to a virus that comes from camels. And we watched it very carefully because we understood that if it took off and if there was person to person transmission mm-hmm. and you had hundreds of thousands of pilgrims going to Mecca because this disease right. was really uh, centered in mm-hmm. Saudi Arabia and mm-hmm. the Peninsula, we could have a potential, you know, catastrophic pandemic. Right. Um, but it seemed like 
many of our government experts were either not involved or asleep at the wheel when this when this most recent uh, outbreak, which we now call COVID-19, uh, occurred. But you know, when Ebola was in West Africa, we were absolutely mobilized in the United States. We had one case in Dallas that came. Mm -hmm. um, all subsequent cases in the United States were healthcare workers. And OSHA worked very hard when I was running OSHA to make sure hospitals were prepared and workers were protected. And there were a number of nurses and doctors who did get uh, infected, but there was no additional transmission in the United States because we, we saw that. We didn't know if it was going to happen or not, but you have to be prepared. Right. Um, when you're not prepared, uh, you know, you can pay the consequences. Right. And of course, we're seeing that every day. Um, you know, you include many powerful examples of the manufacture of doubt through manipulated or made up science in the book. And are there particular topics that seem to lend themselves to such distortions? And what about any kind of specific antidotes that you see that have proven at least moderately effective in waking up the public, so to speak, you know, to the mirage concocted by scientists for hire? Well, you know, almost any environmental exposure, and that includes what we eat, uh, what you're exposed to in workplaces, mm -hmm. anything that's coming from the outside, can be, uh, can lend itself to this sort of scientific um, manipulation or mm -hmm. manufacture of uncertainty. Um, you know, David, you include many powerful examples of the manufacture of doubt through manipulation or made up science in your most recent book. And are there particular topics that lend themselves to such distortions? And are there specific antidotes that have proven effective in waking up the public, you know, if you will, to this mirage concocted by scientists for hire? You know, that's a great question. You know, in some ways, environmental exposures lend themselves to manufactured uncertainty and scientific manipulation. Because all of us, any individual living in any place in the world has so many different exposures. And that can be what's in the air, but also what's in your food, what happens to mm -hmm. your work. Mm -hmm. The example I write about in the book are, are, is diesel exhaust um, exposure. Mm -hmm. you know, diesel particulates have been shown to cause lung cancer. But all of us who are exposed to diesel particulates, because we live near a road or we're, we drive a diesel car or we drive behind a bus or anything like that, we're exposed to so many other pollutants. And so doing the studies that separate out diesel particulates to anything else is really tough. But uh, fortunately, the National Institutes of Health was able to do so a couple of very important studies in deep in underground mines where workers were exposed to diesel exhaust because there are these gigantic diesel mining mm -hmm. machines, mm -hmm. but really nothing else that was carcinogenic. The industry then said, well, we have to take these studies on and show why they're wrong. But before that, it was very difficult to do those study, to do the studies to show that relationship. Mm -hmm. uh, and we see that for uh, what's in our food. We see it in, for example, these chemicals. They're uh, often called the forever chemicals, the uh, fluorinated compounds. They're in Gore-Tex and Teflon. Uh, again, there are very few good studies because so many of us are exposed to so many different things. And so it's very easy to take this on and it's challenging for agencies to figure out how to best protect people. What should we do about that? I think what's really important is to make sure we have a very strong evidence base and we can't make good decisions till we have good evidence. So what I, what I recommend, what I advocate for is building the base of evidence through independent science. And what I mean by independent science is that manufacturers of dangerous chemicals or pollut pollutants uh, should be paying for the research, but they shouldn't be paying for the research in a way that they want to, that they can control the results, because right. that's what the book talks about. Right. There are a couple of models like this. The Health Effects Institute in Cambridge mm -hmm. is funded by the motor vehicle industry and the EPA, and has really done a nice job keeping themselves separate from the industry's needs in terms of uh, protecting themselves, but really doing good studies on the industry's needs in terms of understanding the health effects of exposures. Mm -hmm. But we don't have that in many industries. The, the example that comes to mind most powerfully is e-cigarettes or right. vaping. Right. You know, millions of teenagers literally are regular users of e-cigarettes. We don't have very good 
research into the long-term effects of pulling these compounds into your lungs and leaving them there and then expelling them. I think everybody recognizes that e-cigarettes are a great alternative for people who smoke combustible cigarettes. But right now, these teenagers never started smoking and right. this is getting them going. Mm -hmm. So we need research. So do we think Juul Laboratories or some of the other e-cigarette manufacturers should be doing this research? I would say no, and these are tobacco companies. Right. What we need to do is set up a system where they pay for the research, but they don't control it. Mm -hmm. And I, I think it can be done. Mm -hmm. And I actually think if they really think their product is safe, they should support that same proposal. Mm -hmm. Say, yes, we'll put some money up and let an independent organization figure out how to do the research and we'll abide by the results of that research. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I like that model a lot. And actually, it's interesting because it leads into my next question regarding policymaking. So, you know, as a trained scientist, you were also a former professor at City of New York Medical School, uh, an expert in epidemiology and biostatistics, you know, other and other related topics. So essentially, you're a quant jock, if you will. Uh, but you also were a political appointee and a long term political appointee as head of OSHA. And so you're adept at navigating the policymaking terrain where data are only one factor to be considered in formulating policy. So in general, does a reliance on data and evidence, you know, sometimes the exclusion of other factors such as emotional arguments and appeals to shared values, does that uh, sometimes hamstring scientists who are involved in policymaking because they're not trained or accustomed to these powerful forces in the policy ecosystem. Well, it certainly can. I mean, look, science doesn't drive policy by itself. Mm -hmm. Obviously, we make decisions based on policy, but we make decisions based on emotions as well. And um, you know, we put uh, money and we put restrictions in areas that are chosen not only because the science says these are at great risk or they're at lesser risk, but also because the government will not accept certain uh, endpoints. Mm -hmm. That's true around Homeland Security, for example, where we pour huge amounts of money into uh, stopping bioterrorism, but very little into supporting the public health system, where if you look at really what's the best way to spend your money in terms of preventing disease, there's no question that you, the bang for the buck you get out of uh, building a public health infrastructure is much more valuable than some of the things we did around bioterrorism. But that's not what drives the decisions. But scientists have to sort of understand that, that uh, for us to be relevant, though, we've got to do the best science we can and really put out there in a way that people understand it. And that's you know part of the problem as well, that scientists often think, well, uh, why don't you just read what I wrote? And Washington policy people rarely want to read something that's more than a page and a half. Right. 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 I remember when I was first asked, I was interested in the energy department. If I was interested in working at the energy department as assistant secretary, uh, they said, send me a CV. That's why I sent them my academic CV. Uh -huh. <laughs> uh, the person who asked for it laughed and said, no, no, your one page CV. <laughs> Right, right. The one pager. I just want to see the one pager. That's right. And they don't, they don't care about your publications. <laughs> yeah, right. Total, totally different uh, priorities. Of course, it's not easy to distill things down, you know, like that. A famous saying about if I had more time, I would have written a shorter letter really does, does hold up. And actually, I want to ask you about this. So when you were heading OSHA and you were interacting with policymakers, you know, all the time, uh, sometimes in my former native habitat in Congress and what sort of arguments in support of your policies did you find particularly persuasive? Well, you know, I really looked at this hard and I, I'm fortunate to have had enough experience in this to know that while science and numbers moves you forward, emotions grab you in ways that are really important. And I, actually, I learned this uh, in the early 1990s when I was working in the Bronx, which was the... Um, really one of the centers of the HIV AIDS epidemic. And then I moved to City College of New York in Harlem. And one of the real uh, concerns we had at the time were the number of women who were dying of AIDS because they were IV drug users or the sexual partners of drug users. And they would leave children behind who were healthy, but who had no mothers. And in many cases, there was no father around. 
and there were no programs for them. There was no, the Ryan White uh, funding system didn't provide anything for those kids. And so I was asked to figure out how many children have lost their mothers to HIV AIDS. I developed a mathematical model. We published it in JAMA. Uh, and it had a really big impact because you had these kids with very powerful stories, but you needed to know how many there were. But what I realized afterwards is it didn't make a difference what number I came up with. If, if it was 10,000 or 100,000, the policymakers just had to see this was a real problem and the numbers showed that, but the, they were driven by the stories of these kids. But without the numbers, it would make no difference. So you need both the science and the, the stories. Um, you know, I teach my students in epidemiology to remember that the statistics we're looking at are just people with the tears washed away. And these are, you know, these are, they represent real people. So when I would testify at uh, congressional hearings, which I would do all the time, and I was uh, known in the department as someone who actually liked to testify, which was unusual, I would always tell stories. And for example, at OSHA, when I was defending a, a initiative we had focusing on temporary workers, workers sent by staffing agencies into workplaces. And we often had these workers killed the first day on the job. We called them first day fatalities. I would begin by telling a story about one of these workers and what his life was like and showing sometimes a video of him going to this workplace and watching from the video showing how he died and talking about his family and then talking about the policy and the numbers. But once you tell that story and you talk about how this is real to people and what it does to people, it's very, it was very hard for the, the members of Congress who didn't want to support OSHA, who wanted us to do less, to come back at me and say, well, why do you care about these temporary workers? If you only talk about the science, if you only talk about the numbers, you're much less effective. Right. That's such a great lesson. And of course, you told the story about it. <laughs> so we're all visualizing it. So powerful. So really story first, science second. Exactly. Um, really great. Um, as we wrap up, David, uh, I want to um, ask you about, about this sort of existential threat, you know, to human health that, that we're facing on sort of multiple fronts. Um, it's, you know, posed by or promoted by manufactured doubt. Um, you know, what can listeners do in an effort to turn the tide? Is there anything, you know, our listeners can think about, encourage other people to do, to, to try to push back against this? You know, and this is tough. I mean, all the things that we're looking at, certain climate change, but uh, toxic chemicals, they're all issues that individuals can do very little about as consumers, mm -hmm. You know, as political activists, they can vote, but these are really things that the government has to take on. You know, I tell people, you can't look at the side of the shampoo bottle and figure out which chemical is safe, which isn't. Right. Just, just as the same way you can't, you know, you're driving down a street and you reach a bridge and the bridge starts to shake a little bit and you realize that the infrastructure, transportation infrastructure needs work. As an individual, you can't do anything about that other than push your government to do the right thing. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's very important, especially for scientists to organize and say, this is, these are pressing issues and we really need to address them and we need to address them on a scientific basis. And the government needs to be in the lead on this. Obviously, every institution in society has to address climate change. And, you know, it's nice to see, for example, I just read that Cambridge University has announced they're going to divest in fossil fuels. Mm -hmm. And my university, George Washington University, also just announced the same thing. Mm -hmm. I think we could push our own institutions to do the right thing, but we also have to make sure that the government does the right thing as well. Excellent. And those will be the last words on our episode today. Dr. David Michaels, uh, an expert across the board, you know, both in the academic and scientific realm, and also in the policymaking realm as the longest serving head of OSHA, which is a really big, big deal. Thank you for taking time out of your schedule to talk to us. Well, it was a pleasure talking with you, Mark. And listeners, I really appreciate you as well. I hope you'll be back next time for the next episode of When Science Speaks. This is When Science Speaks, a new web series profiling innovative and interesting people working in science and technical fields, from academia to industry to the nonprofit world. We explore how to be a powerhouse advocate for science and your research how to advance your career in meaningful ways that make you happy, and 
how to push back on the ongoing assault on science and other related issues of interest happening in the world.